My name is Anastasia. I work for JetBrains, and we are actually known not only for doing tools for developers, but also for very professional technical support. And in this talk, I'm going to actually share a couple of funny and sometimes really crazy stories, which hopefully teach you how to provide valuable feedback and how to react on it. So actually, our users think that we are doing our dozens of uh, unnecessary things instead of fixing their precious bugs, like doing uh, various webinars, which is usually done by me and Phil, updating icons, which is usually done by our UX team, but who cares? <laughs> and instead, we actually have to fix compilation issues, which actually is not a uh, task for 90 because we just call the compiler for your code. Uh, and of course, solving real world issues. This is the real support request, and we actually use it to teach our support engineers. And what is the ideal algorithm for providing the feedback, at least how we see it? So like, uh, check you can repeat and construct example, because actually if your problem is only reproducible on a highly NDA code base, I doubt we can do something with that. Check all the integrated tools and stand alone, because quite often your issues are associated or caused by the compiler or debugger or any other tool, which you can actually try to run uh, like separately and check. Uh, check the network and mounted devices because quite often performance issues are caused by the network lag. Report all the details like the versions of all the compilers and operation system and describe the issues and provide some imageries, attach some logs, which is obvious, like keep calm, which is very important. Follow our advices, which is most important thing. And please like come back to us saying that it actually helped because this could be a workaround for the next user. And talking about some examples, like I actually treat support as a learning channel because quite often our student users are asking us how to build a program using a PFRAD. And the answer could be very simple, like just links again, it, everything should be fine, but they still have issues. And actually, if you dig deeper, you will find out that there are many ways to link against PFRAD and they actually depends on the CMake version which is kind of interesting. Another example actually came uh, to us when we just started the C-Line release in 2015 and find out that many users are reporting these crazy things to us that nothing works and the cursor looks strange and the keyboard doesn't work and like while I'm typing on a keyboard, it randomly selects words. We were thinking for, about that for a while and finally, you know what we found out? You know that joke about the Veeam, like, <laughs> uh, I used to be in four for years. Did you like it that much? No, I just didn't know how to quit. That was the situation. They just installed all the plugins from the welcome screen. One of that was the Vim plugin, and just, they just didn't know what to do with that. So we have finally to add this nice warning to like let them work properly. Um, another example here is actually uh, the user who reported us back in 2016. This very nice feedback so, uh, telling to us that we have to resolve his issue within uh, five days. Uh, and he has some issues with uh, like toolchain versions and some conflicts. In 15 minutes, he started shouting at our support saying that we have to resolve it right now or he will move to Visual Studio. And in a couple of more hours, he actually sent us his apologies. In a couple of more hours, we got asked from him. <laughs> I was really feeling sorry about that user. He wasn't sleeping for the whole night. Um, our support engineer actually came the next day, handled the support queue, which is kind of quite long for after the night, and we just found out that the user was confused with the MinGW version, because quite often they see this MinGW version, but it's actually a GCC version, and the MinGW version is hidden inside this creepy heater inside, and c -Line actually extracts it, correctly, but still many users don't understand what's going on there. So we actually explained all the things to the user. He was quite happy in the end, so good to him. Follow the instruction is a very useful advice when you're actually trying to provide a feedback. We have an integration with various debuggers like GDB and LLDB using the EMI interface. And we have, of course, an instruction on how to provide their logs about the debugger issues in the IDE. And we heard it was crystal clear but the users were sending us some logs and we couldn't find anything interesting there and we couldn't match like why the problem is actually happening and we don't see anything interesting in the log. And I know some users actually replied to us that I got the logs but I looked into them and didn't find anything interesting so I just decided not to send it to you. Okay. 
<laughs> but finally, you know what we found out? We have to update the instruction and to add this wording to the instruction because we found out that many users are still reproducing the problem first and only after that adding a setting to like their IDE. So look, we're updating the instruction and hopefully now it's indeed crystal clear. Uh, the first case is about the whole binary, which is actually quite important because once we got our feedback from our user who tried to update from one version to another version using the patch update, and in the end patch update wasn't downloaded properly due to some certificate issues or something in the network, but the user still tried to use the patch. He knew the comment how to call it, everything was broken, he was like providing some negative feedback to us. We of course recommended to download the like binary from scratch and to try again, everything worked. And I really wanted to answer to the user that like when you're building a house, every break is actually important. So like just don't try to patch when you don't have a full binary. But some still do. And a very crazy case that we usually got is about the different configurations. Like we've got a user who had a project which actually builds with some libraries which he could build on Debian and they uh, successfully compiles on Debian 8 and 9. But still this user has uh, like his Linux and also his uh, Windows machine and his Linux uh, was like uh, a project folder on uh, Linux was mounted to his Windows machine and Due to some reasons, he still tried to do some work for the Sigwin, and when the Sigwin stopped worked, working to him, he moved to VSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and something didn't work for him. In the end, we found out like a very simple reason that he just installed the boost libraries with the root privileges on the VSL, and he was running the uh, like application from the C line with another uh, user privileges, and that was the reason. But really digging with all these creepy configurations is a very nice job for the support engineer because we have to like trying to understand why actually all of this is happening to the user. But like really some of our users are providing a very nice feedback to us and really love that users who are sending the code, who are sending all the versions, who are sending all the versions from the, all the compilers they use, whatever they use, and describe the issue and ask us for help. And some of our users are even more nicer, so some of them are writing us nice texts, which I would really love to read as a book. Uh, some professors from universities are complaining to us that their students are saying that their Python code is correct if the PyCharm doesn't highlight any errors, and they're pretty much sure that that should be true. And... <laughs> yeah. 